Question one. The refractive index of moissanite is twice that of water. So if we know that water has the refractive index of about 1.3, then moissanite must have a refractive index of about 2.6. So when light passes from water into moissanite, how does its speed change? Can you remember our equation relating the speed of light to the refractive index? You might remember that as the refractive index increases, the speed of light through the material decreases. So if moissanite has a higher refractive index, then that means that the speed of light through moissanite must be lower than in water. So its speed certainly won't double or quadruple. In fact, looking at the equation, V1 over V2 equals N2 over N1, we can see quite easily that the speed will be halved. There aren't any squares or anything in this equation. Question two, which substance would you expect to have the highest refractive index out of these four choices? Hydrogen gas, helium gas, sapphire, or sugar dissolved in water? Now we have a few options here. Gas, gas, solid, liquid. Well, this isn't really a liquid, is it? It's a solution. So in this last case, we have what used to be a solid in solution in liquid, and this will in fact change the refractive index of the liquid. In fact, by measuring the refractive index of a liquid, it's possible in some cases to determine the refractive index, and from that, the concentration of the solution. So different concentrations of sugar dissolved in water will have different refractive indices. But even if this is the case, we're still just looking at a solution of a liquid. And in fact, we have one of these options that is, has a much higher refractive index than all the others. That is, of course, sapphire. Sapphire is the only solid out of these four choices. Solids have a much denser particle configuration than any of the other options, including the sugar in solution. This means that because they're more densely packed, light travels more slowly through the sapphire, and so the sapphire has the highest refractive index. Question three. Given that in a vacuum light travels at this speed, calculate the speed of light inside a flask of glycerol. Glycerol is a viscous transparent liquid. It has a refractive index of 1.47. So what's our equation to figure out the speed of light inside it? It's the speed of light inside the glycerol equals C, our number here, over the refractive index. Of course, if we wanted, we could, instead of using refractive index, instead of using C rather, use the speed of light in a vacuum and the refractive index of a vacuum. And that's what we've done here. In this case, of course, the refractive index of the vacuum is one. And so the speed in the vacuum, C, is not changed. Substituting in our numbers, one over 1.47 times the speed of light in a vacuum is equal to 2.04 times 10 to the eight meters per second. That is about two-thirds of the speed of light in a vacuum. Part B, how fast does light travel through a ruby, which has a refractive index of 1.76? Of course, in this case, we'll be using the same equation. V2 equals N1 over N2 times V1. Once again, N1 is simply one, and V1 is going to be in a vacuum, light in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Substituting in the numbers once again, we end up with 1.7 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Now suppose we had a beam of light that was traveling from air into these materials instead of from vacuum into these materials. In this case, we would still be using this equation, but V1 would be very, very slightly less than the speed of light, so slightly less that it wouldn't really be noticeable, and N1 would be just higher than one, but once again, in such a small degree that it's not really noticeable. Our final equation will still look like this or this. Question four. When incoming light with an angle of incidence of 45 degrees shines from air into a topaz, it refracts at this angle, find its refractive index. Now what equation do we use here? We use Snell's law, which relates the angles of incidence and refraction to the refractive indices of the two materials. That is, sine over sine r equals n2 over n1. In this case, we want to figure out n2. So we need to make n2 the subject of the equation. All we need to do is multiply both sides by n1. Now taking this equation, we substitute in our values of 45 degrees and 26 degrees, and we multiply by N1. The refractive index of air is about one, and this evaluates to 1.61. So this is the refractive index of a topaz. You can see that this is much higher than that of, say, water or glycerol. Question five. If light passes through two materials that have very similar refractive indices, that is something like 1.3 and 1.4, almost all of the light will be transmitted into the second material. That is, we won't get very much reflection of the light. 
With this in mind, explain why shards of broken glass are especially dangerous in water. Now let's think about this for a moment. Glass has a refractive index of about 1.5. This is very different from the refractive index of air, which is about 1.0. So if we have a shard of glass in air, we don't get all of the light being transmitted through the glass, we get some of the light being reflected. That's why of course it's possible to see glass quite easily. But in water, water has a refractive index of 1.33. That means that it's got a similar refractive index to that of glass, and most of the light passes through. Additionally, the light passing through from the water into the glass doesn't bend very much because the refractive indices are similar. So water and glass have similar refractive indices, about 1.3 and 1.5, and that means that a lot of the light passing from one to the other is not impeded at all. It doesn't get slow, bent or sped up or slowed down very much. And this means that it's very, very difficult to see the boundary between the water and the glass. This means that the shard of glass becomes very, very difficult to see. And of course, if you're swimming in a, a swimming pool with broken glass in there, you won't see that broken glass until it goes through your foot. So that concludes the questions. We've gone through some of the uses of refractive indices and how they relate to the angle of refraction and to the speed of light in the material. In the next lesson, we're going to be looking at dispersion and how we can use prisms and refraction to divide white light into its different colors.